Authors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, book lovers. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and you're listening, watching the Thinking on Paper Book Club, where we read, explore, and do deep dives into books that will change your mind, books that will help you join the dots of emerging technologies. We're reading Quantum Supremacy by Michu Kaku, and this week, it's all about quantum medicine, gene editing, cures for cancer. CRISPR. CRISPR is an acronym. We're going to tell you what CRISPR means. And if that's not worth hanging around for, I don't know what is. Um, is quantum going to save us from the next pandemic? Is it going to remove disease from society? We're going to find out if and how it will do it. Jeremy? What a wonderful tee up, man. That was, Go for it. That was what are you, where do you want to start? Oh man! So my my head my head goes into a couple of different directions as I was as I was, as I was reading this chapter. Number one, the amount of data that is required to do the things we want to do to get ahead of disease, to understand how our body works, to get real time tracking of cancer growing in our bodies before it even becomes an issue. Um, that that just you know as an infrastructure guy like my head explodes a little bit it's like that is a there's a lot of data right but then also you and it's a common theme as well because we spoke about it last week with climate change and the cl the climate crisis and the sheer amounts of data taking data from the natural system and interpreting it the same with material design yeah it's that data which seems to be the conversation in everything it really is. And, you know, how that data is turned into, you know, useful information and how that potentially translates to knowledge and wisdom. A little aside, you know, uh, for, for Right to Know You, I created, created a little newsletter that I pop out every week and, and it talked about changing no how, how knowledge go or how information goes to knowledge and how knowledge goes to wisdom and pointing back to Sid Harda. I don't know if you've ever read that Herman Hess book. Uh, it's a great one, just kind of a knowledge journey, but like, wisdom can't be communicated right so like you know you can't go sit in a lecture hall and listen to an expert and be wise you know right. at the end of the day right but you can learn something you can take in information you can convert it to knowledge and in real time we're hopefully by talking through this stuff are generating wisdom on our own maybe maybe not um i think we're generating wisdom for ourselves we just need a quantum computer to bring it all together and decipher the the the, the data for us hundred percent. So let's talk about, so the first piece was data that I talked about. And then, and then the second was like, just a reminder and, and Michio Kaku does such a great job of like level setting each of these chapters in like, just even though it's a quantum computing book, we get into the fact that like most breakthroughs in modern medicine were happy accidents, yes. like trial and error like just brute force grinding through, well, there are 8,000 possible, you know, connections to explore. Let's just spend a year grinding through each one of them. Right. And then sometimes none of that ever works. And then sometimes like, you know, a guy, guy like Andrew or Alexander Fleming notices some bread mold and, you know, in a Petri dish and like, holy shit, that's starting to kill this bacteria. Wow. That's pretty cool. And then there we have antibiotics. Right. Yep. So um, I don't know what where did what did you think about when when you just that statement like most medical breakthroughs are happy accidents like holy smokes how are we still here if it was luck if it's luck that we found all this stuff right because we're there there are some lucky people out there yeah penicillin um, but I, I like his introduction to the to the the whole quantum medicine with his you know human history until very very recently was short hard and ended in a miserable death and it wasn't really until e even things like hand washing was an accidental discovery almost wasn't it there, there, there was um i got this the hungarian doctor who's working in vienna and semmelweis which i believe is german for white bread <laughs> but um he he accidentally found that washing your hands would prevent it ended up preventing millions of deaths at childbirth, didn't it? And it, like these accidental features and these accidental discoveries. And kind of the thesis that he proposes is that quantum computers can use the data to remove luck from the scenario. And rather than depending on luck, depending on the 
almost infinite connection of occurrences. Well, the um, irony doesn't go unnoticed in the idea of luck, right? Luck is is a little bit to do with probabilities. What is quantum? A series of probabilities, right? Path integral is all the probabilities, but figuring out the most efficient one. So is path integral, is that constructing luck that's a whole nother uh whole nother bit but i wanted to i wanted to chime in on one thing that you said about uh the hand washing thing so i read something this was in a, another book that i had picked up a long time ago was that doctors used to see um used to um evaluate how credible your doctors were by how much blood and dried human stuff from surgeries was on their apron <laughs> and that was like that was like how like oh that's guy that guy's got a lot of blood and gook on his apron he must really know his stuff until someone figured out yo that's probably not the best thing to be walking around into open uh when you're cutting up people and and all of that stuff right uh, well we, we were pretty we, we are pretty useless are we i mean history is just a long line of stupid medical ideas isn't it i mean <laughs> people hot pokers in your eyes oh, i read something about using dead cats on your boils and your or your tumors in the in the god would it, would it have been alive in the middle ages would have been just horrendous but anyway quantum <laughs> what do you say though no, the problem is that like battery we spoke about quantum batteries in the time of volta the basic strategy for medicine discovery hasn't changed since fleming's age yeah and so he goes through this and then there's a part on the COVID pandemic and how that the idea of the pandemic gave rise to ideas that quantum computers could make the situation better. He talks about early warning systems. So in the future with a vast network of medical devices like thermometers and sensors connected to the internet, one might have an instantaneous temperature readout of what is happening around the country analyzed by quantum computers. So, you know, stop another pandemic by having these early warning system goes back to what you said data the quantum computers analyze all this data um then he goes on about using it to decipher the immune system um, yeah so that's it Let, let's, let's unpack that one a little bit like so so unlocking how the immune system works on a minute scale that that's pretty compelling and you really can't do that with traditional compute right like if you if you take just modeling a penicillin molecule, right? And then compare that to the, the largeness, the vastness, the complexity, the, the uh, complicated nature, both complex and complicated, we always talk about, um, of the immune system. Modeling a penicillin model would take 10 to the 86 bits of memory just to model a penicillin mo uh, molecule. So think about what it- That's a lot of zeros. It's a lot of zeros, right? So, uh, you know, modeling or figuring out how the immune system works, holy cow. So you got to have a different, it's like the whole Jaws thing. You ever watch Jaws? D have I ever watched Jaws? I'm one of Peter Benchley's biggest fans. I've read the book. I've seen the movie. I can tell you the book and the movie. I can tell you the differences if you like. All right, so I watched Jaws on on vacation at the beach last week with my kids. Best place and to watch it. I know, right? It just happened to be on. You know, it was like nine o'clock at night. We we're all worn out um, from hanging out. And but but anyway, like it's it's the whole adage. It's like you're going to need a bigger boat. Is the idea of like you know traditional quantum? Like if we want to do all this stuff, we're going to need a bigger boat or a better boat or a different boat or something that moves you across the water that isn't a boat but does the same thing. Which is kind of what we're thinking quantum computing might be doing. Well, I was just reading about IBM, just on a side note, they've opened this new European branch of their quantum department in Germany. And one of its, I think it's called a Heron chip, is this new IBM quantum chip that won't be in this new IBM department yet, but it will be very soon. And I don't want to get this wrong, but I think it was 132 qubits it's going to have. Mm. To replace one that's 127 max so you know it, it's in the last chapter we spoke about thousands and many thousands of qubits so we, we, you know it's a slow process but we're on the journey right and is it and it's the the thread that we keep running into is it is it is it more do you throw more qubits at it or do you make the qubits better you make the qubits work better right because if you have more qubits and you have redundancy but before you know it you've got 
two end redundancy where you have the hundred qubits doing the work and a hundred qubits doing the background, you know, redundancy piece, right? Well, um, spoiler alert, we, we have, we are speaking with IBM to get somebody on the show to speak about it. I think IBM are going down the path of high quality qubits and like rather than D-Wave who are going for uh, quantity over quality, but yep. Stay so tuned. We'll let you know. Let's talk more about, and just, and this will kind of, I think this will kind of wrap up uh, this chapter, but talk about, um, you know, the pandemic stuff and, and major diseases, having things like sensors and sewer systems, right? You talked about the thermometers. So you can have like a collective look at what the average temperature is in Georgia. Like, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. Right. And, and, Collecting all that data in this large repository would would overall overwhelm computers. So could this processing be done by by quantum? And you know, could we see things before they happen? Could we find things in our bodily fluids and see that before even? Um, and I think the next chapter talks about yeah. the liquid biopsies and all that kind of stuff. But really in interesting. Um, just the ability to, we need something better to process that kind of real time quantity of data. Yep. Um, the same, that's, and that's what, again, the, I don't want to bang the drum, but it seems to be the reoccurring story of there, quantum. And then another one, of course, is inevitably with any of this, with these emerging technologies that we talk about, whether it's AI, whether it's quantum, whatever it is, it ends up at some point in the battle against cancer. And it seems to be all paths lead to eradicating this damn disease from humanity. And that's where he goes in chapter 11. And funnily enough, it starts with Nixon and I'm a big fan of <laughs> Hunter S. Thompson. So, you know, anything that goes against Nixon is funny in 1971 with great fanfare. President Richard Nixon announced the war on cancer. Modern medicine, he declared, would finally end this great scourge. Was that with his war on drugs? Was that with his war on... <laughs> it's just <laughs> war. It's it's war. Just war. He declared war on everything. War's the quiver in the... Yeah, <laughs> right? Or the arrow in the quiver. Um, yeah, so let's let's root this. You know, so this, the chapter is titled Gene Editing and Curing Cancer, right? Yep. Which pointing quantum computing into, into being able to do that or being able to work with other technologies yeah. that are out there to, to, to make them better. So let's talk about cancer just, just as a level set, right? I, I found some interesting information here that, that, you know, probably I should have known, but cancer is a, is a disease of the genes, right? So um, that's, that's a really interesting statement. And he talked about the idea of, you know, I think he called it, it's called apoptosis. Is that how you yeah, say apoptosis? That's how I was going to pronounce it. Yep. Apoptosis. So, so cells are genetically Apoptosis. programmed. Yeah, you could say it that way too. So, cells are genetically programmed to die in a natural way to make way for uh, larger organs, complex tissues, that that sort of thing. But well, cells die by they have a mechanism by which they die, so they can be replaced by new ones. That too, a hundred percent. Yeah. So there's actually a, a, a fact that I read across, not in our book here, but uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, um, which is a supercomputing center in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, that uh, that basically that said something to the fact of like every year, like ninety seven percent of your cells actually change. Like, so that that's a whole another conversation because I always think about that. Like, so wait, I'm not me. After a year, like ninety eight percent of my ninety three percent of my cells change every year. So, so there's is that. It like only, and this is gonna. If it's wrong, it's I'm gonna sound like an idiot. But aren't stem cells the only cells that don't that don't die? That don't. Yeah, that that's why that's why there's, that's a whole different conversation. But I think there's something. Stem, stem cells down. can be pointed to make any kind of cell. Ah, uh, okay. Is that what it is? Yeah. But um, so so I retract going, my comment. Hey, I might be wrong too. Remember, hey guys, this is not medical advice. This isn't technology Don't advice. Don't quote this in your PhD. We're not physicists. Um, so we talk about you know this. Genes give you information. They provide information to direct proteins, and those proteins do things, uh, you know, to to make make things in our body. Right. But sometimes the information can be wrong in, in, 
in the genes, right? So errors can actually turn off this functionality in cells and tell them not to die, which turns them into bad cells, right? So check out this quote, cancer cells are ordinary cells that have forgotten how to die. Full quote from, from Kaku. Cancer cells are ordinary cells that have forgotten how to die. Holy cow, right? That's what Well, makes yeah, and then to, to carry on with that, and so our immune system cannot detect them. They fly under the radar. They're not considered foreign invaders, easily recognized, and they could because they're our own cells gone bad. It's an inside job, dude. An inside job. An inside job which, and, and you know, the fundamental problem with the war on cancer was, and put, still is to us, the scientists did not know what cancer really was. And they don't know how it was caused environment is it is it nurture or nature like there's so many different con reasons for it developing every every part of your body can have it there can be nobody knows the real reason and again it's this data isn't it all of the you know connecting the dots across time of finding right well this cool. so these these information hierarchies or this information information nexus let's use that word right so this cloud of things interconnecting and if one thing changes they're cascading effects on the rest of this cloud of information right so that's why it is so hard to figure out because like certain diseases are pin pinpointed to certain genes right and we've known that and we can figure that out and um but cancer is a bunch of different shit working together with the environment with the bad information in the genes with other conditions that are that are in place so it's 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 tough but the future is promising with toilets that well, you were talking are shit. Yeah. Smart toilets, smart toilets, looking at our shit to detect cancer in there, which really that's a, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. So I, I, I read ahead and there's a, there's a fun illustration we'll get into, uh, in, in subsequent chapters, but, um, that again, points back to the data, right? You know, how do we handle all of this data? Let's talk about, um, other technologies that could be amplified by quantum. So really interesting work being done at MIT and Johns Hopkins, developing these microsensors, right? To, to actually be able to smell, like smell bad cells working, right? Like they're, like a bad cell actually has an odor that we can't smell, but dogs can smell. Well, right? yeah, it came from dogs, didn't it? And analyzing odor is a proven diagnostic technique. And then he gives some pretty mind-blowing stats or i found them pretty mind-blowing dogs have been trained to identify lung breast ovarian bladder and prostate cancer Do in fact dogs have a 99 percent success rate in detecting prostate cancer by sniffing a patient's urine sample in one study dogs could detect breast cancer with 88 percent accuracy and lung cancer with 99 percent accuracy the reason is they have 220 million nasal scent receptions, receptors while we have only 5 million. And then there's some, um, it's so accurate that they can detect concentrations of one part per trillion, which is equivalent to detecting a single drop of liquid in 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. So the idea of that cancer has an odor and that dogs can smell it. And so these guys that you mentioned at MIT are creating sensors which are even more powerful to detect the smell early on of cancers. Well, in that one part per trillion, let's compare dogs' noses to our noses, right? So there are 220 million nasal scent receptors in a dog. We only have five. That makes a lot of sense why they can do that a hell of a lot better. But MIT and Johns Hopkins are trying, are they have a, they have 200 X the dog's capability, which that's nuts, man. But again, points to the information they could do. They could, they could take in all the great information but our current compute capability isn't able to make the best use of that, right? So like if we had a better compute capability, who knows what we could do with that data, right? Who knows what we could do that with that information? Cure cancer. Yeah. Um, the paradox, talk to me about elephants and whales and why elephants and whales play a role in the paradox of the immune system. I like this. Yeah, so it all boils down to that that pesky little gene P53, right? Yeah, Pete, Pito's, Peto's paradox. So P, P53 is a gene that is, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not a biologist, I'm not an immunologist, I'm just, this is what Michio Kaku says 
gene 53 is, and I'm trusting him, right? Um, but the gene is especially long, right? Which gives it more places to mutate, which makes sense to me. And when it's mutated, it's found in a large amount of common cancers, right? So they're kind of looking at this gene going, hey, what's going on with this thing? Um, interesting thing I found was it, it, it's also a tumor suppressor gene, right? So it's it when it's functioning properly, it actually suppresses tumors. When it mutates, it does does quite the opposite. But to your pedo's paradox, elephants have twenty copies of that gene, and we have one copy of that gene, right? Yeah. But they have they have less cancer, which is interesting because like it's all boils down to the mutation, right? The mutation chance, the chance of that gene being mutated. So if you had twenty copies of the gene. Wouldn't that increase the level of mutation potential? Well, to, to biologist Richard Petto noticed something odd because of their massive size, one would expect that they would have more cancers than much smaller animals. After all, a larger mass means more cells are constantly dividing and introducing the possibility for genetic errors like cancer. And so, yeah, they've discovered this gene, P53, and elephants have 20 copies of it. They're massive. They don't get cancer on the same scale as small animals, but whales only have one copy of it like we do and they don't either. So they... <laughs> so much, so much we don't know and understand. Um, and then the bombshell that Greenland sharks can live up for f to 500 years of age. That's a long know. time. That's a long one. Um, so I got, got excited by elephants and whales. We forgot to mention CRISPR because I did say that I would explain... The, the, the acronym of CRISPR. What does that stand for? Yeah. Gene, CRISPR, gene therapy. It's one of those... Crispin Glover, is that the guy that was from Back to the Future, the dad? Or is this it's, different? It's after him, yeah. He, he oh, okay. created it, this gene gene <laughs> therapy. Um, get ready for this one. I'll test you next week and see if you remember it. I'm in. Clustered, regularly, interspaced, palindromic repeats. CRISPR. That's what it stands for. Um, in exactly theory... what I would have guessed. CRISPR could let us edit any genetic mutation at will to cure any disease with a genetic origin. Genetic diseases that involve a single mutation are the ones being targeted first by CRISPR, with over 10,000 diseases caused by muta mutations in a single human gene. CRISPR offers hope to cure all of them by repairing any genetic error behind them. And then cancer, sickle cell anemia, AIDS, cystic fibrosis, and Huntington's disease are all in the 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 crosshairs of CRISPR. I I got which brings me to my first not complaint but I found a fault with this book. Ooh, uh, hot take hot take from Mark Fielding, <laughs> Professor Kaku, if you're listening. There's a lot, there's a lot, and I like it because it's very hopeful, it's very optimistic, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of quantum will do this, quantum computers will do this, quantum and CRISPR combined will solve AIDS, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and these different types of cancer, but there's not much how at the moment. Right, yep. And after 200 pages, and after all our book clubs, and after all our guests in quantum, I'm not an expert, but I want to know how. Here's the how. Here's what I take away the how to be. Because they speak the same language, because quantum computers speak the same language as the quantum processes in our body, we're able to unlock how they work. Now, do I know how all of like if you go from like, you know, the 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 one quantum computer that had all the lasers and the mirrors on the table and you know how that is going to model a penicillin molecule? I have no idea right? It's all kind of up here. But the, the fact that it, the fact that it's like, oh, these two things speak the same language. So maybe it works, but no one's really made it work yet. But in theory, it's like, wow, that seems like a whole lot of potential. But yeah, I agree with you. The, the tangible how is not there because they're still figuring out how to make quantum computing work in all the different types and sizes and ways and all of that. And then it's like, whoa, we got to write new software for this. So the new software is a new language, right? So how do we figure that out? Or is it written in an old language? And, you know, we just, we just farm out certain things to quantum and then quantum feeds back to the old stuff. And then we go back in the old language. So I, there's so many different things I think there that are at play that, 
make it really um, challenging to say, well, this is this is how we do it, right? Well, I, I, on the quantum algorithms, I would tell anyone who's listening, quantum software, we have lots of shows on Thinking on Paper where we speak to people who know about that. Um, I think, yeah, you're right. And I think it, it goes back to what you said at the beginning. And essentially, quantum solves all of these challenges in the same way by essentially allowing us to analyze and find the links in just almost infinite data sets. Yeah, I, f I find insp I find inspiration in just the, the the potential of it because the fact that we don't understand quantum mechanics and quantum physics, you know, you and I top to bottom, and and you know, Richard Feynman even says most physicists don't really understand quantum mechanics, right? I think maybe it was Feynman or somebody else, right? But we go back, and it, uh, Michio Kaku points out in this book that uh, this is the most proven and validated like quantum mechanics is the most proven and validated of almost all scientific theories like out to 10 to the whatever the heck they reference in the book i can't remember off the top of my head but if that's the case and we really kind of don't understand it maybe there's hope right like i don't know that's that's where my head goes i, I think that it's a very hopeful couple of chapters quantum medicine is obviously something which as much resources should be put towards because any breakthrough saves lives so i'm all for it i'm very optimistic and i think on that optimism we will look forward to next week's which is about the intersection of, of artificial intelligence and quantum computers oh yes now that's gonna be exciting and with the first line is can machines think so yeah combine quantum and ai what do you get we'll find out next week Stay with us, guys. Read your books. If you don't read your books, listen to us talk about your books. See you soon. Bye-bye.